this video, we're going to talk about how derivatives apply in science. When we're graphing these functions, finding the slopes of the secant line, slopes of the tangent lines, why do we care? What does it mean? So remember that functions in general are relationships in between two quantities. If one thing depends on another thing, it can be expressed as a function. We usually talk about x and y, but x and y can represent any two things that are changing that depend on each other. Here's a few examples. What if the x-axis represented number of bees and the y-axis represented pollination observed in plants? There's going to be a relationship between the number of bees and the amount of po pollination that you observe in the plants. Points on the stock market. Depending on how people buy consumer goods, that may affect what the points are on the NASDAQ. So that's a relationship. How much consumer goods is bought on the x-axis points on the NASDAQ on the y-axis, or maybe over time. As time goes forward, the points on the NASDAQ change, right? So there's a lot of different quantities that we could be talking about here. I'm going to go back to a simple example that we did in class on the first couple days. The x-axis will represent inches of rainfall. The y-axis will represent centimeters of plant growth. If there's no rainfall at all, there will be no plant growth. But as the rainfall increases, so will the plant growth. At a certain point, the plants will get saturated. And if it rains too much, the plants won't like it very much, and they'll die out. Let's pick two points on the x-axis. Each of these has a point on the graph, and we can draw the secant line in between them. The slope of this secant line would be f of 1 plus h minus f of 1 over h. What does it mean? Why do we care? This is the change in plant growth. On the x-axis, this is the change in rainfall. So overall, what is this quantity telling us? The numerator is measured in centimeters. The denominator is measured in inches. For every inch of rainfall, how much does the plant growth change in centimeters? Change in centimeters per inch of rainfall. The slope of the secant line represents an average rate of change of y with respect to x. How much does the y value change per change in x value? When we take the limit as h approaches 0, we get the slope of a tangent line. What does the slope of the tangent line represent physically? Instantaneous rate of change of y with respect to x. It also has something to do with change in y over change in x, but what's happened is that we've taken the limit. Sometimes we say h goes to 0 or x goes to a. The change in x value will have gone to 0. The slope of the tangent line is not exactly equal to a change in y over change in x. It's equal to change in y over change in x and also taking the limit as change in x goes to 0. An average rate of change is taken over an interval. In this picture, the average rate of change was taken over the interval from 1 to 1 plus h. The slope of a tangent line, or instantaneous rate of change, is always calculated at a point, not over an interval, but just at a single point. The length of the interval, the delta x, has already gone to zero. The only thing that's left is a point. There's no interval here. That's what we see on the picture, is that the instantaneous rate of change corresponds to a single point. Let's think a bit more about what the instantaneous rate of change means. How fast are the plants growing if the inches of rainfall is equal to 2. You have kind of a higher slope. They're changing faster. If the inches of rainfall is 3, the plants are growing even faster. If the inches of rainfall is 4, oh, now what happens? The plants have leveled off a little bit. They're not growing as fast as they were before. They started off with their growth being pretty fast. The slope is high. And then here you can see that the slope decreases. The rate of change, the amount of growth per inches of rainfall, has started to decrease. If we're at x equals 6 inches of rainfall, now the plants have started to decrease their growth, so they're dying. Try to think of a few examples on your own. What are two quantities that are related to each other? Call one x and graph it on the x-axis. Call one y and graph it on the y-axis. What does it mean 
when you get the slope of the secant line or the slope of the tangent line. One of the most classic applications, there's an object moving and its position changes over time. In other words, at different times, we get different positions as described by this function. So the function is 1 3rd t cubed minus 4t squared plus 12t. Let's graph the position function and we'll also make a sketch of what the object's movement looks like over time. How do you graph a cubic polynomial? This polynomial is factorable. Factoring is a nice way to graph polynomials. I'm going to factor out one third t from every term. Taking out a third and one of the t's leaves us with t squared. Second term, if I take out a third, that means I need to multiply 4 times 3. So I get minus 12, I take out one of the t's, I'm left with only one t. And finally, plus 36. You can double check. 1 third times 36 equals 12, and then the t is there to also distribute through. Now I can go even farther with factoring. I condense my notation a little bit and just say t minus 6 squared. So it's a cubic polynomial which means it's got two turns, and the second place it hits, hits the axis is at t equals 6. So this is my t-axis, and this is p of t function. Do we actually see this in real life? Of course not. We don't see time as a physical axis drawn out like this. So what we see physically is different. Let's say my object is this pointer. I start observing the pointer. First, the pointer starts to have its position increase, moving to the right. Let's represent this with a right arrow. So the red arrow corresponds to this piece of the graph. As time increases, we see the position increase to the right. Next, the position starts to decrease until we hit t equals 6. So after this initial increase, now my object has its position start to decrease until I get to t equals 6 and then it turns back around and starts increasing again forever. Let's represent these latter two motions with arrows, left and then right. Position increases, then decreases, then increases forever. Looking at it physically, I have an object, position increases, position decreases, then position increases forever. Let's label a bit. This turnaround point occurs at t equals six. Let's also label the starting position position equals zero at t equals zero. That's what we know so far. Now let's talk about the velocity. How fast is the object moving given that we know its position is described by this function? What is velocity? It's the instantaneous rate of change of the position with respect to time. It's how fast the position is changing over time instantaneously. That's what velocity means. In other words, velocity is slope of the tangent line on the position graph. How do we calculate it? We take the derivative. So let's calculate the derivative of the position function. We could either do a long calculation, the limit as h goes to 0, p of t plus h minus p of t all over h. This is the somewhat longer way, but this is the way that shows us the meaning of what the derivative is. From the definition of derivative, we see that the derivative is equal to the change in position divided by the change in time. It's how fast posi position is changing over time. And it's instantaneous because h is approaching zero. Now I could very well calculate this just like we did in the last video. Actually take t plus h and plug it into this function. As you can see, there's lots of foiling involved and there's a lot of algebra. We're going to take the easy way out, and instead we're going to use the power rule. Remember that we covered the power rule in class. The value of this limit will end up being exactly this. The one-third is a constant that I'll just copy down here. Now let's apply the power rule to t cubed. The derivative of t cubed is 3t squared. Minus 4 is a constant, so I just copy it down. What's the power rule applied to t squared? It's 2t. Finally, the constant 12, copy down. What's the derivative of t? It's 1, so I can multiply times 1. The 3's cancel, and we get t squared minus 8t plus 12. This is the velocity function. This is the function 
that inputs time and then outputs the velocity, telling me how fast the object is moving. In part a, in order to graph the function, I factored it. If t is equal to 0, position is 0. If t is equal to 6, position is 0. Right? So I get these two points on the axis. What I'm getting at is that this format is friendly for graphing. That's why I factored it, in order to graph it. Notice that in part c I did not use the factored form. Why is that? Remember how the power rule works. I'm not allowed to use the power rule unless it's a sum or a difference of different power rules. I cannot apply the power rule to a product. We discussed that in class. So you should go check your notes from class. The main point that I'm getting at is this one. This format is good for derivatives. This is the derivative friendly format. The other one in the factored form, that's the graphically friendly format. Factor it if you need to graph it, leave it in this form if you need to take the derivative. Let's get back to the problem. Part D is let's draw a sketch of the velocity function. So what I'm going to do is pull up my position function here. Can you figure out what the graph of this function is in its current format? What we're going to do in order to graph the velocity function is factor it. Then we get t minus 2 and t minus 6. Better double check that foiling. t times t gives me t squared minus 2t minus 6t gives me minus 8, and then a negative times a negative, 2 times 6, gives me positive 12. So my velocity function is a parabola. My parabola crosses the axis at t equals 2 and t equals 6. My graph is really not drawn to scale, but I find these things out as I go along. And if I'd like to draw a new graph at this point and make things a bit more accurate, I can do that. When the velocity is positive, the original function is increasing. When the velocity is negative, the original position function is decreasing. The velocity turns positive again, the position starts to increase. We talked about this in class as well. If the derivative or the velocity is positive, then this implies, here's a little implies symbol, the position is increasing. If the derivative is negative, the position is decreasing. From part b, we made a little diagram showing how the object moves. If position was increasing, the object was moving to the right. If the position was decreasing, the object was moving to the left. Velocity being positive means I'm going right. What does negative velocity mean? It means I'm headed to the left. And in this final regime, the velocity is positive, the position is increasing, and that happens forever for this object. In interval notation, the position is increasing for these t values, and the position is also increasing for these t values. These are precisely the t values where the velocity is positive, over here and over here. So the position is increasing from 0 to 2, and also from 6 to infinity. The position is decreasing from 2 to 6. Why did I include 0? Right at t equals 0, you can see that the position is immediately increasing. In physical problems, we ignore negative time. The presumption being that we only have data for t positive. Why didn't I include 2 here, and I also didn't include 2 here? At t equals 2, it's neither increasing nor decreasing. The velocity is 0. Same thing at 6. 6 is not included here, it's not included here. Because at t equals 6, the velocity is equal to 0, that's neither increasing nor decreasing. So 6 should be excluded. Here's a brief summary. We were given a position function. First we factored in order to graph it, and we got this graph of the position. Then we drew a sketch of the object's movement, which is a more physical representation of the position, in order to represent the object moving right and then left and then right. Next we found the velocity function by using the power rule, and finally, we plotted this purple velocity function by factoring it. Let's go one step further. Let's talk about the acceleration. The acceleration is the rate the velocity changes with respect to time. 
In other words, the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. It represents how fast the velocity is changing over time. So let's look at our velocity function. In order to take the derivative of the velocity function, should I use this format or should I use this format? You guessed it, we want this one to apply the power rule. My acceleration function, the derivative of t squared, is 2t minus 8, that's the derivative of negative 8t, and what's the derivative of 12? It's 0. So actually I have a plus 0 here, but I'm not going to write it because it's plus 0. So this is my acceleration function. It represents how fast the velocity is changing. Let's add that to my graph. Well, this is a straight line, y-intercept negative 8, and I should have a slope of 2, positive. Where does it cross the t-axis? What t-value gives me an acceleration of 0? That's t equals 4. So t equals 4 is an important point. Actually, you can see it's kind of important on the velocity graph, isn't it? That's where the velocity changes from decreasing velocity to increasing velocity. Here's my acceleration function. The acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. Just like the velocity is the derivative of the position. If the acceleration is positive, then the velocity is increasing. You can see that here. Here the acceleration is positive, and the velocity is increasing. If the acceleration is negative over here, this red line is negative down here, the velocity should be decreasing. Everything's matching up, looking good. We can ask even more questions about velocity and position. For example, what were the times when the object was not moving? In other words, what were the times when the position was equal to some number, but the velocity was equal to zero? Can you find those times? We'll talk about these types of extra questions and some others in class. See you then.